In our increasingly digital societies, constant pressure and multitasking have become the norm. But just how far can our brains deal with such overload? That is what Stéphane Buffa, military doctor and specialist in aeronautics, is interested in. He has been studying cognitive load among pilots. In other words, the effort their brains have to make to accomplish the tasks necessary during a flight. The concept of cognitive load began to be formulated in the 1930s with changes in the factory. From there, the concept has been exported into other domains. Aeronautics has driven developments since the stakes are very high in terms of safety. So there is a strong demand to improve practices, or in any case to understand what's going on inside cockpits. The first planes had no instruments, and the pilots back then worked entirely using their senses. Then gradually, the quantity of information grew, reaching a maximum number of dials in the Concorde. There were so many dials they had to add crew members to manage the flight. Then there was a step change with the arrival of multifunction screens, which brought a change in the way the information is presented. This was a reorganization. There's not less information, but it is structured differently. To study the cognitive load among pilots, Stéphane Buffa measures electrical activity in the brain and heart rate, and observes pilots' behavior during flight. Using all these parameters, we're going to evaluate some of your internal activity, which we can correlate with the cognitive load during the flight. What's interesting about these measurements is that they give you a dynamic reading of his state during the flight and the actions, and we can then analyze these readings. With this type of simulator, we can simulate a flight and the occurrence of certain technical problems. These have to be managed by the pilot who will have to deal with this increasing demand. If we give him several competing tasks at the same time, the pilot needs to mobilize all his resources in terms of both memory and attention. He has to manage his priorities to execute his actions. Okay, engine failure. Decision height. Okay, we're down. Everything's fine. When the helicopter pilot has to deal with a mechanical failure in a power line, he has to decide which is the most immediate danger. You will probably treat the power line as an imminent emergency, but switching tasks has a cost in terms of information treatment time and in terms of errors. You can observe this in a simulator mission. With this simulated engine failure, the pilot has to deal with a sudden flood of information. It is therefore crucial that he does not make any mistakes while he has several tasks to accomplish. Activation of the malfunction. Okay, Dennis, malfunction has occurred. Can you manage a conversation at the same time? Yes, we'll see. Can I ask you what is three times four? Uh, I can answer 12 at the moment. And can you recite the alphabet backwards? Just a moment, let's see. Z, Y. Each time you switch tasks, you will slow your response time, and you'll also become more tired. The impression of dealing with multiple tasks is deceptive, because in fact, each of these tasks is dealt with superficially. For the 
The subject manages to give the impression of performance faced with these multiple tasks. But when you look a little closer, you can see that as he changes priorities, he might modify his performance criteria downwards. He thinks he has done a good job, whereas in fact he has lowered his performance criteria. So there's a real impact in this multitask mode. Deactivation of all malfunctions. After analyzing the data recorded on the memory card, the experiment shows that the multitask mode reduces performance even for an experienced pilot. Thanks to digital devices, many claim to be able to multitask. But most of the time, the impression of efficiency this gives us is little more than an illusion. What is going on in our brains when we handle several tasks at the same time? And what impact does multitasking have on our attention span? That is what Aurélie Bidet-Collet, neuroscience researcher in Lyon, is studying. The scientist is trying to understand how our different kinds of attention interact depending upon our environment. I don't think there is only one type of attention, but that there are several types of attention, and that these types of attention are based on different cerebral mechanisms, different types of activity in the brain. And that's what I'm trying to unravel. Among the different types of attention, Aurélie Bidet-Collet is studying sustained attention, which allows us to remain attentive for several minutes or hours, and our selective attention, which cuts out unwanted background noise in our environment. The researcher wants to understand which mechanisms are working together when we perform dual tasks. There's an experiment in which we try to measure brain activity in a dual task situation to see if it's possible to carry out two activities at once. You'll hear your name, and the aim is to count how many times you hear it, so the number of times you hear Judith. At the same time, numbers will appear on the screen, and you have to click using the mouse when you see the number two. All right? All right, let's start. Judith. From the electrodes at the back of the head, we're starting to see slow oscillations appear, which show that her vigilance is dropping, and so she is less attentive towards the task in hand. The analysis of Judith's brain waves shows that trying to accomplish two tasks is leading to a conflict in her brain because she is using the same network of neurons. When you try to answer the phone and write an email at the same time, the brain tends to alternate between the two activities. And what happens is, when you go to write a bit of the email, you will miss what the person tells you on the phone. If we do two activities that depend on the same brain networks, such as writing an email and speaking on the phone, we're using the language network for both, and so the network becomes saturated. Inevitably, at least one of the two activities will suffer. In the workplace, we often operate in a noisy environment, with phones ringing and co-workers talking, what scientists call non-pertinent information. Like the beeps in this experiment, these sounds interfere with our attention, even though most of the time we are able to ignore them. The brain has inhibitor mechanisms which reduce our responses to non-pertinent sounds. It's as if the brain makes them silent, cancelling them out, and therefore stops reacting to that input. These inhibitor mechanisms are essential. Since our brains are continually bombarded with sound and visual information from our immediate environment, 
But the dual task situation upsets these filters, as Aurélie Bidet-Collet's experiment shows. When we find ourselves in a situation facing dual tasks, the inhibitor mechanisms are greatly impaired, and we are far less able to filter non-pertinent stimuli from the environment, like the sound of a nearby coffee machine or someone passing in the corridor. The experiment shows that in a dual task situation, we are much less capable of cutting out noise and our attention suffers. The notion that some people are multitaskers is thus refuted by scientific studies. The fantasy that consists of encouraging youngsters to think they might be more capable of multitasking than their elders is not supported by any serious cognitive study and fosters a compulsive zapping that will do them a lot of harm. What is quite remarkable is that we might expect the younger generations to automatically have a lower level of stress since they were born into a digital world and so they are supposedly at ease with digital devices. Surprisingly, studies show that the opposite is true. Notably, a major European survey among 30,000 employees, which found that stress rates among the young compared to their elders when it came to information and communication technologies were significantly higher. 